I was in a store two days ago, and it was a clothing store, and I was hanging out waiting for Joy to buy some shoes. And I saw a kid and his dad in the men's section, and they were um, arguing with each other. I don't know how old the kid was. I'm guessing 12, because that's about the, the age they get mouthy. Any 12-year-olds in here? They get mouthy before that. He wasn't old enough to buy his own clothes. We had some testifying over on the left-hand side there. Um, and uh, they were arguing, and I heard the dad finally say, and I'm eavesdropping here, of course. The dad finally said, I do not care what you want to wear Sunday. Your mother said we're going to match she and your sisters, and that's what we're going to do. And um, the kid uh, sort of huffed and, and then tried on this really bad, you know, weird shade of purple shirt and um, argued with his dad the entire time. Now, I don't know if that speaks to you this Easter, if you've ever had an Easter like that, or if you feel like maybe um, uh, I just felt bad for the kid because sometimes we make Easter about matching, but we forget to really focus on the, the point of Easter, who is, is Jesus. And if you match today, that's fantastic. And if your kids didn't give you lip today, good for you. You're a great parent. But today, Easter is about Jesus. And I want to talk to you about Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews talks about Jesus. The writer of Hebrews was an ex-religious person who was writing to a group of people who were supposed to not be religious anymore, telling them to quit being so religious. They had fallen back into their own, or their old legalistic ways. And he was writing to them to remind them that Jesus had come to free them from religion and had come to free them from the, the stuff, the having to be good enough and know enough and do enough and to, to match the way that, well, they'd been told they had to match their entire lives. In the, the author of Hebrews writes at the very beginning of the book, in the past, God spoke through our ancestors, through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in the last days, he's spoken to us by his son, Jesus, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Jesus was the way God chose to communicate to us. What God had to say, he said through Jesus. The first thing that the writer of Hebrews tells us is that Jesus was the creator of everything. In the book of John, Jesus told his disciples that he was going to prepare a place and come back to get them and to get us and to be with him and to be with him forever in heaven. That the word that's used here for that Jesus created the world or the universe is not just what we enjoy here on earth, but everything that exists. And I only know one other person who can create by spoken word. And I've already mentioned her today, and that's my wife, Joy. Now, she's not Jesus, but she talks to him a lot. And the other day, we were just going about our business on a normal morning. And Joy, as she was leaving, she said to me, she goes, I hope you really enjoy cleaning the garage today because the weather's so nice, it's a perfect day for you to have picked to clean the garage. <laughs> and I had not, I promise you, for one second thought about cleaning the garage that day. And I got a little attitude about it. And um, she left. And about 30 minutes later, I had this thought in my mind. I probably should clean the garage today. And it had nothing to do with joy. I mean, it just, she planted it in here. And by her spoken word, she created a clean garage. When she came home, all she did was smile at me. And she was like, I got you. I know. So she's not Jesus. She talks to Jesus. He's given her some tricks. Jesus created everything by his spoken word. That's the way Hebrews, the author of Hebrews starts it off. The second thing that we see in the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is the exact representation of God. So if you want to know who God is and what he's like, all you need to know is who Jesus is and what Jesus is like. Compassionate, graceful, full of mercy, noticing those who the world doesn't notice, extending a hand and touching the untouchable. God. Jesus is God with us. Well, the third thing the author of Hebrews tells us about Jesus is that he sustains our lives. I love to do this when I think of this passage. Would you take your fingers and would you put them on your carotid artery and feel your pulse? You guys look great today, by the way. Easter Sunday, sharp looking crowd. A lot of you match. <laughs> Do you feel the pulse in your neck? The Bible literally tells us that Jesus sustains your life 
and the heartbeat that you have is given to you by Jesus each and every moment, that he is with you in the moment. He didn't give them to you at the beginning of your life to use as you want to wind down like a clock, but that he literally sustains the biological functions of your life and of the person next to you and next to them and in front of you and behind you and across the room and across the city and across the state, across the country and across the world. Jesus is working individually, simultaneously with every single person and mechanism and scheme in this entire world, sustaining everything by his power. So we see that Jesus is the creator, the reflector, the sustainer, and he is the purifier because we were born sinful and needed someone to intervene. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory and the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And that at Easter, when Jesus laid his life down on Friday and rose again three days later, he defeated sin, Satan, and death once and for all and provided purification for our sins so that you and I could have a reconciled relationship and spend eternity in heaven. Well, finally, and if you're paying attention, Jesus is the creator of everything. He is the reflector of God himself because Jesus was God and is God. He's the sustainer of our lives. He's the purifier of our souls, and he's the finisher of our faith. Remember last week when we talked about the temple? In the temple, you um, had the court of the Gentiles. And remember I talked to you about the fact that if you weren't here, that's okay. I'll talk to you about it now. The court of the Gentiles, the outer court of the temple. You walk up the stairs, and then you go through the beautiful gate into the court of women. And then if you're in the court of women, you could be a man or a woman in the court of women. You would walk up the stairs again into, well, past the Nikian gate into the court of the Israelites, the men, and then up another set of stairs and through a gate and you would go into the court of the priests. And then above that, the Holy of Holies, in the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark of the Covenant was a copy of the Ten Ten Commandments. Aaron's staff, a jar of manna, On top was a seat with two carved angels with wings outstretched protecting the seat. And every year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the seat that was judgment until the blood was sprinkled and it symbolized the presence of God providing the forgiveness of sin temporarily. Now, the author of Hebrews says, that Jesus was the purifier of our sins. And then when he was finished with his work, which means he died taking on our sin, rose again, defeated sin, Satan, and death, and a few weeks later ascended into heaven where he took a seat at God's right hand. And he's seated there permanently in his blood on that mercy seat, seals our salvation. It indicates to us that the work necessary that had always been about do, 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 was now done, D-O-N-E, in Christ. And he provided the way because he was the way, the truth and the life. So let's look together at this resurrection story because after all, this is Easter Sunday morning. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away and they entered the tomb. And as they did, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified, and Jesus has risen, providing the purification for our sins, finishing the work necessary for you and I to have peace with God, with each other, meaning in this life, and a hope that blows the human mind. And we celebrate that on Easter Sunday morning.
Some things are hard to see. And uh, Joy and I were at the airport not too long ago waiting to pick up my mom and dad. And we were watching people come out of the airport and catch their rides, wondering where people went, trying to guess where people were based on how they were dressed and the luggage they had. And um, killing time. And we saw a lady come out of the, the terminal quickly and ran to the car in front of us. And, um, you know, she was running with purpose. And I thought, somebody's getting ready to get some love. This is going to be, you know, so Joy and I are sitting behind the car behind and waiting for the reunion. And the back window of the car in front of us rolls down and a dog, and I mean a big dog, like a husky, sticks its head out the window. And the lady gets licked by that dog in the face for a good 45 seconds. And Joy and I could not look away. Now, I've got a big dog that likes to lick, but I say, no, Daisy, don't lick in the face. And this lady, I mean, every square inch, she backed up. And I thought, thank goodness, she's got some sense. And she went back in and that dog licked. That cannot be, I could not look away. It was hard to see. <laughs> some things are surprising to believe. My dad on that trip did something that surprised me. I bought an Xbox oh, a while ago to play Call of Duty with my kids and found out that I'm so bad at Call of Duty that I got uninvited from every party that they had and from the Call of Duty team. I was no longer on the Call of Duty squad. Um, but I did find a game that was just my speed and that was um, PGA Tour 2K23 Golf. And so Richard and I, we play, my oldest son, 27 in Arkansas, we play golf on the Xbox and uh, we play once a week and hang out and we talk and I have a headset and I nerd out, you know, just like a gamer. And um, my dad was there and uh, I won't tell you how old he is, but I'm 53 and he had me when he was 25. Um, PhD, PhD in New Testament, Greek professor, New Testament professor, written commentaries, smartest person I know, bar none. He was watching the game and he thought that looks like fun. And so we played a little bit over Christmas and my dad went home and bought an Xbox and a headset. And now my PhD seminary professor dad, myself and my son from three different states, we play PGA Tour 2K23 golf once a week together. And it's so much fun, but I was really surprised to hear, never expected my dad to spend time on such trivial pursuits. Some things are too good to be true. When Jesus two weeks before his crucifixion and resurrection, chose to raise Lazarus from the dead. In John chapter 11, a woman named Martha, one of Jesus' close friends, came running out to Jesus and was upset at him and questioned him. Now, Jesus was allowing himself to talk to a woman, which was scandalous of the, in the day, to be questioned by a woman, which was unthinkable. In that day, most women were dependent on the faith of their husbands, and if the head of the household was right with God, then the rest of the household sort of got lumped in. And one of the things that Jesus did that was so radical is he came and he elevated women and levelized the playing field at the foot of the cross. Or even a woman like Martha, who we had a, a close sister-brother relationship kind of with, was able to come to him and talk to him and question him. And he responded to her and he said to her, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now I want you to picture Jesus, maybe with Martha, who's upset having just lost her brother, not knowing Jesus was going to raise him from the dead yet. Perhaps hand in hand, looking at each other, distraught, filled with grief. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. And the one who lives believing in me, they'll live. They won't die. And then he looks at her with only the compassion that Jesus could look at you with. And he says, do you believe? The creator of the universe and everything that is, the reflector of God's greatness, his character and his nature, the sustainer of our lives, the purifier of our sins, the finisher of this religious faith. Looking into the eyes of a woman filled with grief and cared enough to tell her, you are important, you matter, do you believe? Well, there's sometimes in our lives where we know that we 
need the Lord and we rely on him and think about him more than others. Part of it's our sin nature, part of it's human nature, it's just life. And I'm wondering if you can remember a time in your life when you were sort of rocked and you knew the only thing you had to cling to was this faith, this gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes patterns repeat in scripture and numbers, and I'm, I don't get too preoccupied with the numbers, but three is kind of a significant number. And in the resurrection, three is very significant because on the first day, Jesus was crucified. And oftentimes the world presents problems. Sometimes we present them ourselves on the first day. The second day, the world waited after Jesus was crucified and watched and wondered, could he, will he, is it too good to be true? And then sometimes you and I, we wait and we watch and we wonder, will God, can he, is he going to, is my hope and my faith in him too good to be true? And then on the third day, Jesus rose again, confirming that he could, he would, and it wasn't too good to be true. And I was thinking about this number three and it occurred to me that three years ago today, almost exactly three years ago today, you and I weren't in this room together. But do you remember what was happening three years ago? If you need a little help, it was 2020. And this was Easter Sunday, about the fourth week of the unthinkable. Churches were shut down. And you and I had Easter Sunday morning somewhere else. And when everything changed, when we realized the world would no longer be the same, it made us think. And it made me think. And our church staff, it made us think. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to take you back. I'd like to take you back three years. And I want you to remember where you were. Remember how much you knew you needed Jesus Christ. And ask yourself, do you still feel that way? So let's watch this video and I hope it takes you back. Hey, good morning, Capital City Church in the Des Moines Metro. This is Pastor Rick Mellick, and I'm so excited to be with you this Easter Sunday morning. Happy Easter. I'm coming to you from location here on the John Beal Farm in Rock Creek Vineyards. What a beautiful place. In a couple of weeks, there's going to be seeds going into the ground. Corn and soybeans are going to be coming up, representing new life. It reminds me of the new life that we have in Jesus Christ. Well, that was three years ago. And here I am back on location at the John Beal Farm in Maxwell. And Pastor Jared and I, well, we are knocking the rust off and we've taken it back outside just like we did three years ago during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, I know many of you who are part of the Capital City Church family, you weren't here three years ago. And so this may be new to you, but like any blended family, when you look at pictures of history and connect to the past, it helps you know a little bit better um, what's been been happening and what's going on. And so for us, our challenge was three years ago when church was shut down, when we had to, to have, well, church, many of us from our couch <laughs> eating waffles. Remember those days? Pastor Jared and I, we took the show on the road. We found locations all over Polk County and even up here in Maxwell. And we tried to do something special to be able to connect messages to you so that you could continue to worship. Now, three years, a lot has changed in three years. I love coming back to places like this, the John Beal Farm here in Maxwell, a beautiful piece of property. And it looks to me like not much has changed. There's something reassuring about that. But we, we live in a world that changes all the time. And what I'd like to do today is talk to you about three things that the resurrection really impacted in my life. It made me appreciate the resurrection of Christ even more three years ago. COVID-19 forced us to look at the resurrection of Jesus in ways that perhaps we've not ever looked at the resurrection previously. And so I want to discuss these things with you. And I want you to think about where you were three years ago. I want you to think about the feelings that you had, the uncertainty of the future, 
all of us, none of us, we didn't know what was next. But we do know that we serve a God of certainty. We serve a God who knows what happens next. And the resurrection, the reality of Jesus Christ in our personal relationship, it mattered so much then. Does it matter now? So as we've already talked about, in John chapter 11, Jesus said to one of his very close friends, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he says, do you believe this? Back here at the barn with my two close friends, Willie and Nelson, or whatever their names are. After three years, I still haven't found out. Friendly horses, and even horses, love to live in community. One of the things that impacts me that is just such a powerful reminder of how important relationships are, are the way that Jesus treated his closest friends at the very end of his life here on earth, before his crucifixion and resurrection, as the time drew near for Jesus to enter Jerusalem and spend this last week doing the things that we've been discussing over this last week and then ultimately giving up his life on the cross for us and rising again, well, Jesus spent a lot of quality time with his close friends. He knew that living in community was far better than living alone. He also knew that he was leaving his message, the gospel, what you and I understand is the truth that's so important we give our entire lives to. Well, he was leaving it with a hand full of people, the 12 disciples, a group of friends that might have been hanging around the disciples, and then, of course, his three very close friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We know that Jesus went back to Bethany and spent the night each evening during the last seven days of his life here before the crucifixion. And I wonder what those conversations would be like. Can you imagine Jesus having been in Jerusalem during the day, doing all of the things that Jesus did, coming back home, perhaps having dinner with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, Jesus knowing that his time was drawing near. What were they talking about? What were they thinking about? I would love to have been a fly on the wall just to hear the prayers. One of the things that I remember well about the pandemic as we went into this uncertain time three years ago was that the uncertainty, uh, the lockdown, this global crisis forced us to pay attention to the relationships that were closest to us. Some of us may have been neglecting those relationships. We found ourselves with the people who we should love the most, who we should have the most influence in their lives, and we were literally living in such close proximity that we had to figure out how to get along. For some of you, it may have been starting over. For some, it may have been, well, making new friends and trying to figure out how to form community online because you perhaps were by yourself. But as I look back over the last three years, I wonder if living in community is still as important to you now as it was then. Knowing now that we have options, that we have things to do, that we're no longer locked down. Do you still have that quality time with your family? Do you still invest in those people closest to you? Do you still check on your neighbors, people who maybe you worked with? Is the concern still there like it was? Jesus was always focused on relationships, and he understood that the gospel was passed from one person to the next. Sure, he taught Sermon on the Mount, taught large crowds, spoke to people, but oftentimes you see him pairing off in small groups, groups of two, maybe groups of 12, sharing the truths of the kingdom of God, investing in those close relationships. And I wonder, has the resurrection impacted your closest relationships today, like perhaps it did three years ago? when you were forced into that close community with the fence of COVID-19. Well, another thing we were faced with during the pandemic three years ago, as we were literally right here filming an Easter service, was uncertainty regarding the future. Everything that we took for granted, that we expected to happen, the normal life that we had come to appreciate was really up for grabs. Nobody knew what was going to happen next. You know, I was thinking about the fields and how farmers, when they plant, they put seeds into the ground. They take a lot of care in cultivating the crops and making sure that all steps are taken and every I is dotted, every T is crossed, and usually they get exactly what they planted. If done correctly and the seasons cooperate and the rain is appropriate, well, they always reap a reward from their hard work. There was a time three years ago when we had no idea if we were going to reap any rewards for our hard work. Do you remember 
Many of your kids who were at school every single day were no longer in school and you as a parent or a grandparent had to become a teacher. Many of you who had worked in an office or, or somewhere else off the side of your home for years and years and years working on a career, if you weren't laid off, often you were sent home and some of you are still working from home today. Everything changed. Do you remember the uncertainty of the economy that we faced? We didn't know if the stock market was ever going to recover, if the banks were going to fold if we would have any money to even take care of our most basic needs. Do you remember the moments of desperation when we clung to the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we took Jesus at his word, when on this Sermon on the Mount that I mentioned just a few minutes ago, when he told that crowd so many years ago, don't I take care of the birds? Have you seen the flowers in the field? You don't have to worry about your life. I have numbered every hair on your head. I know how many days that you are going to live. We have learned through Jesus' teaching and by observing his life that there was certainty in our relationship with Christ. But do you remember how important that was to us three years ago? We hung on to that because we knew that that's all that we had. And I'm wondering today, as things have gotten back to somewhat normal, or again, at least this new normal, if we are still as dependent on the Lord for our future, for our sustainability, as we were then. One of the things that I think impacted all of us three years ago on that Easter Sunday morning when we were filming right here on the John Beale farm, was that with a global pandemic that none of us truly understood yet, but uh, certainly had our attention, all of us really began to think about death. And it's kind of morbid in some ways to talk about it, but we were faced with the reality that life is temporary, that um, people die, and that one day all of us are gonna leave this life behind. Many people are afraid of public speaking, Some are afraid of spiders. Um, I don't really like heights. Um, Many of you, you might can relate, but all of us fear death. And what impacts me about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what impacted me so much three years ago was the fact that when Jesus voluntarily went to the cross, taking on my sin and your sin, the sins of the world, fulfilling the prophecy in the Old Testament, making good on his promises that he made personally in the New Testament, like in the book of John when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. By going to the cross, taking on our sin, allowing himself to be put to death, being dead, and then rising again, defeating sin, Satan, and death once and for all, so that anyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus, in Jesus alone, isn't going to perish and deserve the consequences of of death, but can have eternal life in Christ Jesus, who um, we call Lord. And many of us three years ago, we knew people who died. Some of you may have had family members who passed away from COVID-19 or complications of COVID-19. Maybe you had friends who lost their lives. But at least in some moments, I think all of us came to a point and a time when we had to consider the fact that we believe that there's an afterlife and that there is a heaven and there is a hell. And we certainly don't want to end up in hell, but we certainly want to spend an eternity in heaven. And many of us, because of this pandemic three years ago, realized how important the resurrection of Jesus Christ was because Jesus made it all possible that if we put our faith and trust in him, that our sins can be forgiven, that our eternity can be secured, that we don't have to worry about life here and the surety and the predictability because Jesus controls all of that, that we can invest in those that are closest to us. In John chapter 11, verse 25, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me isn't gonna die and those who live believing in me, you're not going to die. And then he looks at Martha, a lady who had been with him, And looks at Mary and he says, do you believe? He was so concerned that his friends believed in him before he actually left and wasn't able to influence them in the same way that he was by being with them in such close proximity that he was offering them freedom from the fear of death. 
So I'm wondering today, just like three years ago, when you were thinking about it perhaps for the first time, are you absolutely sure that your relationship with Jesus is solid, that you've given yourself to him, that you've trusted him as your Lord and Savior, and that if your life was taken from you or if you lost it today or tomorrow or next week or next year, do you know for sure that you would end up in heaven? I wonder if the power of the resurrection, the truth of the resurrection of Jesus is as important to you today as it was three years ago. The resurrection changes everything. And the pandemic and this new normal is only a better normal if we remember well. And so I trust that this little walk down memory lane out here at the John Beale Farm in Maxwell on this beautiful afternoon, as we celebrate Easter together, I trust that you'll remember and you'll remember well because the resurrection changes everything. How many of you guys remember high school? Um, everybody remembers high school. How many of you are in high school? Anybody in here in high school? I'm sorry. Uh, high, school was, high school was rough. I mean, I, I, I like high school in some ways. Most of high school, I was like just waiting to get out and move on. I moved when I was actually in eighth grade, which isn't quite high school, but it seems close enough. We moved from South Florida. I lived down South, South Florida, you know, like West Palm Beach, the real Florida, and moved to Memphis in eighth grade. And I was just a fish out of water. I mean, I, I noticed a couple things right away. One, I was freezing all the time, and that was Memphis, friends. So you talk about, you know, up here, it's even worse. And then the second thing I noticed were all the girls were just super pasty. It was like no one ever went outside. They were just, because in Florida, everybody was at the beach all the time. It was just really strange. People wore socks. And, and um, I was at a new, new school, and I didn't own a jacket. And um, there was a, a party that was happening and I was just trying to fit in, just trying to make, make friends and schools can be clicky and kids can be you know, rough and there's an in crowd and there's a group of kids usually that are kind of wanting to get in the in crowd and are just sort of hanging around and just can't. And then there's a group of kids that have just kind of given up and they try to form their own crowd and they're never gonna be in the in crowd. You have all kinds of different groups and cliques. And there was this one party that was happening, a birthday party and the kid's name was Nikki and I haven't gotten over it yet. And I'm not gonna say his last name because he might be watching online and I don't want to stir up old wounds. I mean, after all, it wasn't that long ago, eighth grade, 41 years, um, 40 something years. So uh, this party was happening and I didn't get my invitation. And I kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally on Friday, the party was that night. I went up to Nikki, I had, I guess, no social skills whatsoever. And I said to him, what's the deal? Um, am I invited to your party? And he said, nope. And I'm like, why not? You know, I've never even, it never occurred to me someone wouldn't want me in their party. And uh, he said, well, you don't know anybody. He said, you'll be uncomfortable. People will be uncomfortable with you there. He said, nah. He said, you can't come. And I remember what that felt like. It didn't feel good. I wanted to go to the party. And I was told I didn't fit in, that I didn't match. That it'd be better if I stayed home. When Jesus came into this world, the religious leaders of the day were professional professional, eliminators, excluders. They had formed an in crowd and they alone set the rules as to who could get in and who couldn't. And friends, almost nobody was good enough. And it wasn't God's standard and it wasn't what Jesus had in mind, but it's the way it was. And Jesus came and through simple statements like this, one that was too well, almost hard to believe because it was too good to be true. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will never die. Your eternity can be secure. And if you live this life believing in me, you, you won't die, that your eternal life can start here through your peace and your purpose and your hope, that your life is sustainable because Jesus sustains life. And he made it personal by looking at somebody like Mary, like me, and like you. And he says, do you believe? Because Jesus came to break down the walls of exclusion and religion and put a period at the end of the sentence, D-O-N-E. So my question is really twofold. First, do you believe? Have you come to a point where you 
have confessed your sin. You've agreed with God. I have had thoughts, actions, and attitudes displeasing to you, Lord, and I have confessed them. Forgive me. I don't want to sin anymore. Number two, we tell God we believe who Jesus is as much as we know and you've learned today that Jesus is God's son, that he was God. He lived a perfect life. He took on the sins of the world that he didn't deserve and died a death, rose again three days later, defeating sin, Satan, and death once and for all so that you and I could have peace invited to the party and to tell him that you wanna live for him and that you wanna be a follower. You wanna be a Christian. Your life is now his. Do you believe? Have you told him that? He said, I don't know how to tell him. Super easy. God's installed in you a part of you, a thinker that's already ready to think your thoughts to God. And he, being God, the creator, the reflector, the sustainer, the purifier, the finisher, hears every thought and welcomes you home. And then the second part to this question, have you slipped a little bit if you have become a believer? If this is something today that reminds you as we look back just three years that maybe that you've slipped back just a hair, that the dependence that you once felt on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the purpose that you had in your closest personal relationships, the way that you counted on God for what's next tomorrow and the next day and the next month and the next year, for the peace that comes when you know that if you lose your life, if your life is over, that the real life is just going to begin. Have you slipped away from that? Do you need to come back? Is today the day to come home? Easter, my friends, is no better time. And I want to encourage you, whatever it is that God may be speaking to you in or about, say yes. And if you want to talk to somebody about it, Pastor Dan and myself will be right here around our church staff. There is nothing we like better than to talk to our friends about our relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, thank you so much for Easter. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his resurrection. Thank you that he defeated sin, Satan, and death. Thank you that he made and provided the way because he was the way, the truth and the life, the way to the Father through Jesus. That Jesus invited everyone to the party and the only person who won't be included is the one who excludes themselves. So as we remember and remind ourselves today, Jesus is waiting. The resurrection and the life. Do we believe? We love you. We thank you for moments like this, days like this, friends like these, and a time to celebrate the event that changed everything. In Jesus' name, amen.